through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 207. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Rise of the Guardians, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking Alec Baldwin. Oh, uh, yeah. Big fans of Alec Baldwin. Can't believe we really haven't talked about him specifically. Mm -hmm. As of now, we've talked about him passing through films and Alexander whatnot. Baldwin III. Is that his full name? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think his middle name's like... It's weird, and so I don't want to butcher it wrong. I think it's like Nay, like N-A-E or something. It's a, he has a... His born name is like Alexander Nay Baldwin the Third or something like wow. that. It's a, one of the Baldwin brothers, of mm -hmm. course. One of the band of Baldwins. Probably coming this fall probably to Showtime. <laughs> the most important Baldwin, though. You know, Stephen Baldwin had a, a moment there with he had, he had, Yeah, he had a blip suspects, in the nineties. Then he got religious, and you know yeah. that he had a blip in the nineties. But I would say Alec is probably the most oh, prolific sustained, yeah. and sustained Baldwin. Yeah. Most beloved and most despised, probably, too. Mm, despised? Right? Oh, during the early 2000s, oh, okay. man, with his divorce and whatnot. Uh, yeah, he was not a popular yeah. dude. Anyway, let's get this party started. Uh, we're going to talk Beetlejuice again, because mm -hmm. that was probably the first thing I remember seeing oh, Alec yeah. Baldwin in. And it's, and it's funny. It's totally dude, young Alec Baldwin. It's sexy yeah, Baldwin. Thin, yeah, thin, svelte Alec yeah, Baldwin. Yeah, this is yeah. the like, ladies' man. You can understand <laughs> there's like the sexy Baldwin. And it's funny because. He is the star of Beetlejuice. He yeah. and Gina Davis. Mm -hmm. But they never, never get the credit for it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's always forgotten. And yeah, Beetlejuice I mean, is only in the movie for like 17 of its 90-something minutes. And you think, you know, they had a, a TV show mm -hmm. that they did. With, yeah, it was, based with around the Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice and Lydia. Yeah. And then they were going to do a, another movie that mm -hmm. they talked about, mm -hmm. which was, again, based around Beetlejuice yep, and which Lydia. Which I will bring up. In, uh, and it's just sort of like... The movie is named Beetlejuice, like, and yet it's just like there's so many things going on. It's just sort of like at one point the movie was they didn't like the name Beetlejuice, and so Tim Burton said that they should name it Scared Sheetless. That'd be funny. And they almost went with it, and he was so surprised that they were going to go with it that he was like, No, 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 please don't, please change it back to Beetlejuice. Like, like honestly, does that really seem like that much better of a title than Beetlejuice? <laughs> no, though, like, that's why he tossed it out as a joke. But like, I mean, even if they were like accepting of it, mm. I mean, if you're at the point where you're like, Yeah, scared sheetless, that mm -hmm. sounds pretty good. You're like, Beetlejuice, though, I don't know about that. Scared sheetless, that makes sense. Like. Really? Are you yeah. like? I mean, you got to be pretty dumb if you're. Thinking. But yeah, Alec and uh, Gina, Gina Davis, Davis both play the the dead people. The dead. The and, I mean, dead which couple. is which is interesting because um, not only do they play the original dead couple, mm -hmm. but they're they're put in a position where they're transitioning during the film, and they're trying to. They're sort of like. I don't know what you want. The spirit guides mm. of the viewer yeah. as they're sort of learning that. about that world. Yeah. We're learning about that world. That's sort a of a clever way of doing exposition. Yeah. So that, you know, it's not just like, oh, by the way, here's everything you need to know about being dead. It's exactly. sort of like yeah. they're figuring it out as they go along. The like pseudo narrative state. Yeah. Kinda, yeah. And it's kind of interesting, though, too, because as it went forward with, you know, the cartoon and I don't know about whatever the script for mm -hmm. Beetlejuice goes flying was up. or whatever. I'll, I'll bring but it up. <laughs> essentially, Beetlejuice gets murdered with their characters yes and he's like this friend mm -hmm. of lydia who he's not in the movie not at, all. at all like in fact <laughs> like if you watch the movie it is um what are their characters name adam and barbara mm -hmm. they're the ones who are friends with lydia yes. they befriend her during the movie yes. at the end they're like celebrating mm -hmm. her doing well on a test with her almost villainous yes he's terrorizing yeah. her he's forcing her to marry him mm -hmm. you know he's the he's ghostest with the mostest like it's just it's it's so <laughs> weird how how this that mutated spin, like i mean they clearly spun it because of the tv show mm -hmm. i mean obviously with a name like Beetlejuice, you can't not have him be in the TV show. Yeah. And he's probably the more dynamic of the characters. Yeah. But... And I think like, also, on a probably a marketing perspective, they're, he's so covered in makeup that it'd be easy to transition well, him without having him make it. Well, that's... I mean, they won the Oscar for Best Makeup for wow. the movie, so that oh, makes yeah. total sense. Well, I mean, and also because Adam and uh, Barbara's... Did. Adam and Barbara's... Oh, yeah. Like, when they're trying to haunt that... That oh yeah, it was great. So it was great. great. But it, uh, classic I mean, early eighties. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 sort of interesting to think about though in that context that like to make it ch child friendly. Yeah. The cartoon would have to be. You can't. I mean, are there any cartoons about like villains as the lead protagonist? I can't imagine. <clears throat> or I mean, I, I kind of the mask when the mask had a cartoon because he was kind of villainous when he was wearing his mask. But he's still. I mean, he's still sort of that Jekyll and Hyde thing. You still have like a good guy at the end yeah. of the day. Like it's it's just like. 
people don't want to make cartoons about bad guys because yeah. maybe that glorifies mm -hmm. bad villainousness yeah, or something probably, like yeah. that. And now so, I think maybe like post nineties, it's probably a lot more like gray area stuff where you have pseudo villainous like or anti heroes. But back in the eighties, there was they didn't have that as much. It was much more black and white. I don't even know if today, like I like if somebody can write in and write like let us know of some series I mean, that are like, villain driven. All just, of the Star Wars spin-off series because they're still all have, revolved like, around anakin in the in the end but i mean there's still like you know the clone wars and stuff you still have like was it the rebellion fighting against no, them? It's, like there's there's still a significant good presence true. and yeah. if they made beetlejuice the way he is in the movie yes like it would true. really just be him terrorizing people every episode like, yes that that would not be a good thing <laughs> like i don't think you want your child to be picking up terrorizing i mean just players. look at the difference of like the sandworm with beetlejuice's face in the movie and then sandworms being the thing he's afraid of that he runs away from in the cartoon like, i mean he's afraid just... of him in the movie to be well, fair yeah, like but... he's not a, he's not a fan of the sandworm but as you brought up the sequel um not surprisingly because how well the movie did box office uh there was plans for a sequel and it was called Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. That was the tentative title. A script was commissioned. Michael Keaton and Winona Ryder were both signed on to reprise their roles. But Tim Burton lost interest in the project. So literally, that's the only thing that stopped it from going forward was Tim Burton's lack of interest. There wasn't oh. anybody else holding it up. And instead, he went on to do Batman and Batman uh, Returns. But it's even more complicated than that because I think there's actually renewed interest well, now well, even in bringing it, Beetlejuice back. Well, yeah, it said as late as 1996, which Batman Returns was what nine was that in the 92, 90s? I 92, think. Yeah, I think so. So you're talking like four years after Batman Returns, uh, Warner Brothers was still trying to get the original sequel concept oh, it to pushed it, into production. It make it makes sense, but I think I mean as of now, like I'm talking I wouldn't be 2012. No, I, wouldn't be surprised, like, I think yeah. I think you know they've renewed interest in doing well, yeah, Beetlejuice goes along. We've decided that we we're just going to remake everything now that Well, I don't even think they they might even bring Michael Keaton back for it. But here's the thing that's even more worth knowing is that uh, Bat uh Beetlejuice after Pee-wee's Big Adventure, mm. they wanted to do uh, Batman, okay. but he didn't have enough uh, gravity with the studio uh, okay. to do it. It was the success of Beetlejuice huh. that paved the way to make Batman. And, I mean, it makes sense that they want to continue doing it because yeah. that made Tim Burton and Michael Keaton mm -hmm. massive stars. It's yeah. sort of like, oh, here's just another franchise we can take mm -hmm. advantage of it. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I love Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis in it, though, and it's a shame. see how much, how well it did. No, it's not 70, bad. 73 million dollars domestically. Yeah. So that's like four or five times the budget domestically, not yeah. even worldwide. I love so. the fact that the budget is estimated at 15 million only because just the other day I read that the pilot episode of Boardwalk Empire, which was the most expensive TV pilot ever, cost 18 million dollars really? to make and was directed by Martin Scorsese. So that hour of television, even though yes, 30 years difference, but still. I, I just, mean, I know Rome was up there. I mean, they spent like what 100 million dollars to make Rome. I don't know how mm. much was spent on the pilot, yeah. but that's interesting to think about. Yeah. Anyway, let's move along a couple mm -hmm. years forward. We're going to do uh the I think is the first time jack ryan yes, was seen cinematically and it's we're also the first jack ryan story chronologically and we're talking the tom clancy character yes. of course and that is the hunt for red october mm -hmm. this is the sub classic with sean connery and yes. his twenty thousand dollar hairpiece you have twenty thousand dollar hairpiece in that movie yep mm. Wow. Uh, the, anyway, the story is essentially, you know, a submarine with a captain who mm -hmm. may or may not be a good guy, yes. essentially. And who is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Defecting. Yes, defecting to yes. Russia. And, I mean, obviously, this is right during sort of the tail end of the Cold War, so mm -hmm. it works out pretty well. But Jack Ryan, theoretically, I mean, unfortunately, he's kind of dwindled in his film. Yes. Um film role since yeah. what was it the ben affleck mm -hmm. iteration some of all fears. some of all fears yeah. that's right but he was he's he's got to be up there i mean you know sort of you think about franchises like mission impossible mm -hmm. and sort of characters like ethan was it ethan hunt e ethan hunt yeah he's sort of like in the same sort of vein mm -hmm. as that is sort of like this badass just spy like, type character yeah, who classic always classic american the hero of like the governmental somehow you know, government funded agent who always does the right thing and i mean i i will say you know at least earlier on it felt more like he was sort of an analyst mm -hmm. who was yeah. sort of trying to figure his way out not like you know a super spy who's yeah. sent to save the day or crazy action hero but as it became went on you know with harrison ford it got progressively more actiony and mm -hmm. then 
Ben Affleck it became like super action. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Alec Baldwin, I think this was really sort of when he started getting that acting mm-hmm. chops, or sorry, action chops, I should say, where it's sort of like a really big budget thriller mm-hmm. type film. And it's a great film. It's interesting that it was, uh, you know, dr- I didn't realize it was directed by John McTiernan. Tier- Nen, sorry, Don McTiernan. Yeah, who passed because of his obligation to after signing on to this was unable to direct Die Hard Two. I think he dodged a bullet there. Honestly, like I don't, I don't even dislike Die Hard Two, but it's it's okay. It's just yeah. really Die Hard One yeah. done again. I wonder how much better it might have been if John McTiernan was. Well, if it. you think about it, he did Predator. Mm-hmm. He did Die Hard. Mm-hmm. He did Die Hard with a Vengeance. Came oh, back that's for that right, yeah. one. He did Last Action Hero. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that movie. Uh, he did Medicine Man. <laughs> he did the Thomas Crown Affair mm-hmm. remake, and he mm-hmm. did the Rollerball remake. Uh, so yeah. I would say the majority of the time he's pretty solid. Yeah, like I think he's a pretty darn good action director. So it couldn't have hurt it, at the very least. It's also interesting, you know, now in in the la- I'd say in the last ten years when we're evaluating movies that have come out with the way special effects have been done mm. and television now we can just assume so much stuff is done post-production green screen and special effects and things like that but it's crazy to look back on stuff like this from our youth and remember that they obviously didn't have that Mm. and hear things like the following the underwater model of the red october submarine has never been in the water Hmm. the effect was achieved by using smoke on the underwater set and a few digital touch-ups like so probably adding bubbles and things like that the sub was hung by 12 wires from an overhead grid which gave it the ability to tilt and turn as was needed i mean i guess you know it's sort of like you know being in space like when you're in it you wouldn't expect to see it so yeah it's sort of it's kind of that's kind of interesting yeah in terms of jack ryan though what is your sort of ranking of the three of them I really enjoyed Alec Baldwin's portrayal because, I mean, young Jack Ryan, I, I read a couple of these the Tom oh, you Clancy did? books, okay. actually, when in my youth. I think I read, uh, I didn't read some of All Fears, but I know I read Patriot Games and what's the other one? Uh, Clear, Clear and Present, Present Day Danger. Danger. Yeah. And I know I read Hunt for Red October. So at this, I think it's better. Harrison Ford has a hard time looking like a um, newcomer or someone who's learning, and I think mm. Alec Baldwin at this time was good at looking as like the fresh young agent who's kind of trying to adapt, and like you said, the analyst role. Yeah. So I, I really enjoyed his kind of presence as that, as like kind of Joe America who's just trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, on. it's sort of interesting, you know, it's, it's kind of like... Um the talented Mr. Ripley mm. in that you had Matt Damon doing the young one. And then yeah. I think was it, um, I forget John Malkovich oh, did an right. older sort of version yeah. of him later. And I mean, it's sort of funny to compare Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford's not playing the young whippersnapper yeah. Jack Ryan. He's like the veteran yeah. Jack Ryan at Seasoned that point. Jack Ryan. And you know, I, in case you didn't know Jack Ryan in the books at one point becomes president. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I probably, I think, you know, I really like, Clear and present danger. Mm-hmm. I think that one's great. Mm-hmm. Patriot Games is decent too. Yeah. Uh, I, I would probably put Harrison Ford as my top Jack Ryan, probably Alec Baldwin second. Mm-hmm. Ben Affleck isn't even bad. It's I've, just that I, the movie has a lot of problems well, going on. My bigger problem was that, that a nuclear bomb went off during the Super Bowl and they killed like 50,000 people. It's sort of like, I don't really know how good it is if you save the world, if you still let 50,000 people die. But like, that's, a, that's a lot of the Jack Ryan stories. Like I'm saying that the whole, like, I forget which book it is, but later on there's a point where he, Jack Ryan. It's very James bond yeah, jack ryan ends up being like he's some person in the u.s state government mm. very very low and a terrorist plane crashes into like the white house or congress mm. or something and kills everybody in the succession to president except for him kills like all of G- chiefs of staff president vice president cabinet like congress and it's like this dude ends up being president and that's totally how the stories go is it's he's the guy who somehow lives through this crazy scenario. Yeah. Because you have to have a hero protector. It's a fun character. I wish they'd do more with him. Sadly, some of Ophir's kind of sidelined that, but I'm sure he'll be back at some point. Moving forward to probably one of his most acclaimed performances, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a film that is frequently associated with David Mamet. Yes. Though he only wrote it. Mm-hmm. He didn't even direct it. It was directed yep. by James Foley, who did, you know, Fear, The Chamber, That's right, yeah. Corrupter. He also did Confidence, which felt very David hmm. Mamet-like, yeah. but had no association with David yeah. Mamet, as far as I know. Um, Originally, obviously, a stage performance, yes. um, like most of David Mamet's original work for theater or before they go to film. <laughs> uh, it's one of Alec Baldwin's best, yeah, probably, no doubt, doubt. roles. I, I still think his... That this film is still used and showed to salesmen. Um, For, it was a real estate office, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. 
And, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, he had the sort of, was it, um, inspiration, <laughs> if you want to call it that. <laughs> Mo let's say motivational. Motivational. Okay. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's so intense, and it's sort of funny for him, like this young whippersnapper, mm -hmm. to be delivering this speech. But that's part of it, is that he's are that successful already at that right. age, and that's how he can have the chop, the brass balls to say such rude things to these older right. people. Right, I mean, we're talking people like Al Pacino and mm -hmm. Jack Lemmon, yeah, and I think it was Ed, Ed Harris. Harris, Alan Arkin. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's that what is one of the elements that makes his speech that much more yes. powerful, as he's like... And if you haven't seen the film, it's about real estate agents who are trying to meet a quote essentially mm -hmm. that's that's essentially what the film starts out as and it's it it gets really interesting and complicated pretty quickly but uh alec baldwin's speech in the probably the first act of the film uh he he based the tone and the delivery of it on george c scott's uh speech mm. in Patton, which is totally totally makes sense when you yeah. see it um i also think it's interesting it's one of those things that when i'll have to go back and watch the film again to notice this and this is the kind of thing that would be clear in like probably clearer i think maybe in a stage performance mm. than a film but whenever one of the main characters in the film is in a position of power they're chewing gum need to chew more gum yeah uh, al pacino's character ricky whenever when he's mocking ed harris's attitude is chewing gum uh levine jack lemon's character when he's insulting williamson played by kevin spacey is chewing gum and then after ricky's been taken in the office and then williamson again kevin spacey when he's telling um Jack Lemon that he's up to no good. He's also chewing gum. Hmm. So whenever somebody's in a severe position of power, they're chewing gum, which nice. I find is just an interesting little thing to yeah. toss out there. Also, also, all the main actors didn't audition for their roles. They were just given the roles. I mean, when you have those quality of actors, it's not really that absurd to just give them those parts. But yeah. it's interesting, you know, Al Pacino was nominated for supporting actor, mm -hmm. lost to Gene Hackman for Unforgiven. Mm. It gives you a perspective historically mm -hmm. of when this came out. Yeah. Also, the script was nominated for a Writers Guild Award for David Mamet. He lost to <sighs> Michael Tolkien for The Player, the Robert Oatman mm. film. So, that's tough. Mm. I mean, in retrospect, like, The Player's a solid film, but mm. um, Man. it's tough to yeah. not award this one, especially with speeches like the one Alec yeah. Baldwin gets. So. Yeah. You're, what is it? Um Coffees for closers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Coffee. Hey, maybe you're a closer. Sadly, not everything he did, though, was um, mm -mm. money, if you will. He did a film called The Shadow yes. in 1994, based on the radio drama from back in, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, was it? 30s. 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, about a hero who is able to i don't know if it's control people's minds so that he's able to disappear or if he's able to just control something that he's able yeah. to make him self disappear there was two and, different forms of the of it and he had different powers in each one they combined them for the movie okay so he has powers that make him able to you know disappear aka yes. be a shadow mm -hmm. when fighting evil and I, Cloud men's minds, I think, yes. is the way they yeah. like to say what, it. What evil lurks in the heart of men? Shadow, shadow knows. Um, I used to love the audio dramas. Mm -hmm. I still listen to them from time to time. <laughs> and it's a great character, but it's one of those ones that seems like it'd be a tough transition to film, much like, say, The Phantom, I was, if you oh, think about yeah. the Billy Zane. Another one character. I was going to say is The Spirit. Mm -hmm. more recent one it's like uh, i think there's a lot of directorial problems there well yeah but i mean still sometimes trying to trying to it's hard to do pulp throwbacks correctly because when a lot of them when they're made are not necessarily high quality work a lot of it was the kind of cliffhanger aspect or how how short or simple or how fast these things were being turned around. So it wasn't always necessarily about like some amazing like David Mamet written uh, complex script as much as it was like serials, you know? Well, I think I think there's an element of you have to take a concept of what the medium you're working mm -hmm. in is. For instance, um, Wolverine. I've mm -hmm. long said you look at Wolverine in the comics and that character works. Yes. But if you made the comic version yes. of Wolverine in a blue movie and yellow with his blue and yellow spandex with the giant horns, mm -hmm. it would look ridiculous. Yes. And they had to update that to make it work in yes. a film sort of environment. Definitely. I feel like, you know, it's not that this character is unworkable. I, I mean, I think the character is great, mm -hmm. but it was sort of 
created in this context of being like you know like an action hero and yeah. that's not necessarily really who the shadow is correct it's more of like a noir mm -hmm. type drama type thing it's the same sort of thing where i wrote my review of twilight breaking mm. dawn part two is that you know when i look back at twilight I look at it as sort of like this dra romantic uh -huh. drama type series, and they're throwing these giant battles yeah. in. And it's sort of like, yeah, that's fun, yeah. but that's not what the series necessarily is. Exactly. And so when yeah. you make try and shoehorn a film into yeah. an idea, then it yeah. doesn't necessarily work out as and, well. Yeah, I mean, The Shadow was much more about noir and mystery and detective work than it was about being an action star. I mean, because it started out, so it made debut on radio in 31 mm. uh, as a third-person narrator of mystery stories on Street and Smith's Detective Story Hour. Uh, when fans of that show wrote the creator asking him for adventure starring just The Shadow himself, mm. um, Street and Smith hired Walter Gibson, a magician and former ghostwriter for Harry Houdini, of all people, uh, wow, to write a cool. monthly series of pulp novels about this character that had already existed. So the Shadow Magazine ran until 1949 and is considered the most successful pulp series ever. Wow. Um, beginning in 1937, it's the Shadow started in his own radio show rather than just being part oh, of that yes. one, and I know. featuring Orson Welles as Lamont Cranston and uh, Agnes Moorhead as Margot Lane. And you can, I mean, there's all sorts of like podcasts out there, like old time radio mm -hmm. and stuff that I've. I listened to at yeah. this point that you can still hear a lot of those old sort of shadow stories. Yeah, and I mean, other actors played the shadow over the year, but it ran till 55. So 37 to 55 as a radio show, that alone, outside of all the other stuff. And when they made the movie, they took the combination of the, the ra different radio formats and some of the different stories or cases that had happened and the pulp novels, and they kind of combine them together like i think his ability to cloud men's minds and go invisible was from the more the radio show mm -hmm. but the like his twin guns and things like that were more from, from the, the pulp novels mm -hmm. so they kind of blended them together it's it's i mean it's not like a terrible film i actually think i saw this in the theater i but... actually was have been waiting to tell you the fact that i saw this film in a double feature film where me and my friend were the only people in the theater for both films it was the shadow and the crow Crow's a it's solid film. Awesome. Shadow, Shadow's not a bad film. It's just, it doesn't feel right. Is sort of yeah, my it's, basic. Yeah, it's like the it's like the Phantom. That's a great you know, that's a great comparison. It's just like, it feels like they should have either waited longer to make there be more of a gap, or it's, it's not I don't even know. That. I mean, it's like I mean, so, or fifty. Something. We're talking like fifty years, but it's yeah, it's just sort know. of like I feel like you just have to, you have to adapt embrace, it. Yeah, you have to adapt it to current times rather than trying to just port it over to film sure yeah so. i mean there, there there is an element of yeah you just gotta you gotta work the material you gotta take the inspiration of the material yes. and fit it into what the requirements are for the yes. medium and sort yes. of find the hybrid there mm -hmm. instead of just doing exactly what yeah. was done before and, and when you have mystery that you're usually hearing or reading and you're putting it on the screen you can't turn that mystery into just over action that's not no. the same no Let's move on to The Edge mm -hmm. from director Lee Tamahori. Also written by David, David Mamet. Wow, that's funny. I know. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I didn't even realize <laughs> that. That's funny, yeah. It, make, it makes a lot of sense, though, actually, when you think about the drama of The Edge. Yep. The Edge is a story about a billionaire mm -hmm. who goes, you know... Um, kind of outdoor, an outdoorsman. Outdoorsy, yeah. yeah. Uh, who ends up crashing his plane with... Uh, Another couple guys. Yeah, he he suspects that this photographer who's out doing work with him is having an affair with his wife, yes. and he confronts Al McPherson. Yes, yeah. and he confronts uh, Alec Baldwin's character about this, and then the plane crashes. Mm -hmm. and like then, right after that, and then it's sort of this like survival mm -hmm. story where you're sort of trying to survive at the same time. You don't know if Alec Baldwin's just going to try and bump you off exactly. at the same time yeah. because this is like an opportune moment mm -hmm. to do it. You got a bear. Who's chasing after them yeah. the entire time? Bart the bear, play, yeah. who also was the bear in Great Outdoors, and the bear in the movie, the big bear in the movie, the bear. Yeah. It's been a lot of movies actually. That Bart, bear. Bart probably dead at this. Yeah, point. this was his last film actually. Oh, it's a poor uh, one out for Bart. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's it's an intense film on mm -hmm. all sorts of levels. I mean, it's it's it's. I like the idea of having to work together. Mm -hmm. With someone who you don't trust. Yes. Like that sort of like um, element of 
playing each other. Mm -hmm. It's like a card game, uh -huh. sort of like yeah. who's bluffing, who's telling the truth, what can you believe? And I, I just I think that sort of oh, I mean it makes total sense why David Mamet mm -hmm. wrote the script and it really yeah. works well for That's it. That's actually I was reading something that was saying that while it completely seems like on David Mamet esque at first glance, when you think about it, carries a lot of the themes that he has, like male characters butting heads over power struggles and you know things like that. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's really it's intense. It's sort of funny to think, you know, when you're being hunted by a bear, that that might not necessarily be the thing you're, you're the most afraid of. <laughs> well, the thing that's most dangerous too. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like it's it's great, mm -hmm. and it, it's sort of interesting also to see, see Alec Baldwin in a non-hero yes, role i, I mean not, bring thus up. far we've talked about him basically all as sort of hero with the exception of glenn gary he's kind of right sure okay and, yeah. and, and that's where i think that's what i think makes the edge for me so enjoyable is i think he's kind of tapping back into that well, that more i mean even on, glenn on gary edge <laughs> i mean even glenn gary i think is an element sort of like a lot more shades of gray yeah whereas like this one you know he's playing a guy who Possibly breaking up a marriage yeah. and possibly going to yeah. kill... Most likely an adulterer. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> and he's going to possibly kill Anthony Hopkins. Uh -huh. so it's sort of like, these things aren't the makings of a good guy. And like, They're not? No. Shit. Best case scenario... Stop trying to kill Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> Best case scenario, it's like, you don't kill Anthony Hopkins. Like, that's like... like but, but you live. Yeah. That's like your exactly, best case yeah. scenario. That's like the best case scenario. Like, And so... <laughs> I don't know. I, th I think it's a great film. It's an interesting look at like Lee Tamahori's career. He directed Along Came a Spider mm -hmm. um, with Morgan Freeman. Okay. Yeah. This is the sequel to Kiss the Girls. Yeah, yeah. And then he did Die Another Day, the mm -hmm. Bond film. Okay. This is the Madonna one mm -hmm. with Holly Berry also. Mm -hmm. He did Next oh. with uh, Nicolas Cage. Uh -huh. He did Triple X State of the Union. Oh, the one with Ice Cube. Yep. Ice T, I mean. Ice Cube. Ice Cube. I'm yeah. sorry. And he did The Devil's Double. Which actually was pretty interesting. Which one's that? That was the one about the stunt, not stunt double, the, the double for, was it Kusei Hussein? Oh, yes. Okay, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I think it was Kusei. It was one of the Hussein yeah, brothers. Yeah, I know what you're talking um, about. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so he's got a kind of eclectic, wide variety mm -hmm. of career, and this is interesting sort of fit in there. And I don't know, I think, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. I think it's a good mill. But unfortunately, The Edge was probably, I mean, I won't say the last major film success that Alec Baldwin has had, but I feel like after The Shadow and then The Edge... I don't know, was The Edge successful financially? Uh, I don't know the budget, Okay, but it was not a huge profitable film. Yeah. I mean, best case scenario, it made $34 million worldwide. So unless it was cheap, it was not Ooh, a huge not success. Not much at all. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, he, he, unfortunately, Alec Baldwin started to taper off a little bit here. He tapered off a little bit. He's sort of like, uh, I don't want to be mean, but he packed on a little bit of weight. Yeah. He wasn't quite as sexy mm -hmm. as Got he used to older. be. Yeah. Got a little older. He went through a really public divorce with Kim Basinger, Ugh. who, I mean... It was nasty in a lot of ways. It's sort of around the same time, I think, the Winona Ryder shoplifting oh, yeah. stuff was going on. And, like, he was, there's, like, audio tapes of him belittling oh, his daughter right. and stuff that came that's out calling her a right. piggy and stuff. So he really, Ugh. really had a lot Damn of bad media. publicity <laughs> there for a while. Yeah, so he, he, he definitely was not, like, the um, sexy, mm -hmm. sexy name that he was there for a while. Yeah. And as you said, he got older and he was doing sort of more older parts, like, mm -hmm. you know, It's Complicated and yeah, stuff. He was doing films right. like that where it's, it's not... Where he's getting more into playing father roles than yeah, playing... Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also he had started out with Beetlejuice being a, a very comedic sort of yes. performer and he drifted much more dramatic mm -hmm. and... He was sort of stuck in that dramatic area there for a while, and he's finally sort of swung back into yeah, comedy. Thank God. But uh, that that probably didn't help either. Yeah. But but you thankfully, know, it, it 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 did work out for him though. I mean, during that sort of dip in his career, he did The Cooler, which yes. we spoke about when we talked about William mm -hmm. H Macy, and which this is, I hadn't seen at the time, but I have now seen. And the story thank of you Netflix Instant. Yeah, you can watch it there mm -hmm. or Scarecrow video. Mm -hmm. But that's a story of a guy who's essentially bad luck yes. for a casino in the sense that he's not bad luck to the casino. Yes. The casino uses him for bad luck to people who are yes. having good luck. <laughs> Which and, is such an awesome, awesome yeah, idea. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Alec Baldwin plays sort of the casino handler Owner, yeah. yeah and Runner. which makes a lot of sense if you sort of extrapolate to like jack donaghy with the mm, rock and stuff yes. he sort of plays that um 
a more serious version of Jack Donaghy, yeah. but nevertheless a guy who's sort of very focused on the bottom line. Yes. As opposed to... <laughs> Definitely focused on the bottom line. Right, but like, you know, one is comedic and one is yeah. dramatic. Yeah. But both of them are mm-hmm. equally focused Did on... Sort of character's name, what, Shelley, I think? Uh, Shelley? Yes, Shelley. Kaplow. What yeah. a great name. Yeah, it's a good, good name. But <laughs> I forget what's William, William H. Macy's... Like, Bernie Lutz. Lutz. That's right, yeah, Bernie Lutz. Lutz and Kaplow. <laughs> Lutz and Kaplow. Kaplow. Um, <laughs> Belisario for <laughs> Maria Bello as well. What did you think about it now that you've seen it? Oh, it was it was a great film. I I was kind of surprised I hadn't heard about it earlier. Like I hadn't had it brought to my. Well, attention. I mean, it's one of those things that if you remember when it came out, like this is the only thing he's ever had an Academy Award nomination. Really. For. Best Supporting Actor for this. The only thing ever... Interesting. Kind of, yeah. You'd think with a guy like Alec Baldwin, yeah. something. I mean, and he's had Golden Globe nominations yeah. and stuff for whatever. Um, but, yeah, only Academy wow. Award nomination. And this is the same year that Mystic River came out. So oh, Tim Burton... Right. Or, sorry, Tim Robbins. Tim Burton. <laughs> Tim Robbins <laughs> was destroying him in every award mm-hmm. show with that. And it was sort of like, will this be the one that uh, Alec Baldwin wins? It was like, no. Nope. Like, he was, he was essentially... That year, I'm trying to think of like a comparison, like um, uh, Christopher Plummer mm. for Beginners, uh-huh. where it was just like he was absolutely just dumb. It was like he was like the sure thing, or Natalie Portman uh-huh. for Black Swan, yeah. where it's like, you know, there are other people in the category, but it was it was like, but almost, clearly it's going to this. It one. was a foregone conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Like if you were to bet, he was like the one of the like sure fire ones mm-hmm. was to bet on t- Tim Robbins yeah. winning. So sadly for Alec Baldwin that just happened to be the year that he got nominated, but it was it was a good performance yeah, nevertheless. Yeah, and it's also inter- I mean in with a movie that deals with such a uh, weird concept of a person actually being like a personification of luck mm. um or at least you know having like luck that exclude exudes from them and affects sure. people around them they do such a great job at dancing around ever fully talking about it mm. it's like it's not like it's not discussed but it's almost more like alec baldwin's character assumes it's a skill that william h macy has and mm. so when it starts to go away he's not like it's not this weird metaphysical conversation about sure. why it's gone away it's just like you need to do that again what you're doing and so i thought that was a really interesting handling of that how yeah. they just kind of let because oftentimes when you have a concept that's that strange uh if you don't address it too much people lose the connection with it and i think they did a good job of just kind of dancing in circles around it but alec baldwin plays such a great like almost almost mob boss personality yeah no running totally it. i mean it, 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 I mean, and I just love what he, how he treats Ron Livingston in this film too. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's, it's a it's a great film. Sadly, mm-hmm. underappreciated. I mean, the director Wayne Kramer really hasn't done much else of major note except he did a uh, Running Scared, that Paul Walker film. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, I also think it's interesting to note that uh, on the DVD commentary for the film, William H Macy brought up the fact that he was given three different suits to wear during the film. Interesting. And during scenes that where Bernie was hapless and unlucky, he wore a suit that was two sizes too large for him. Uh, during scenes where his luck was just starting to change, he wore a suit that was one size too big for him. And after he falls in love and is extremely lucky, he wears a perfectly tailored suit. Interesting. So interestingly enough, and I I, th- I think I'd read about this when we talked about it last time, and so I started, lo- uh, when I watched it, I kind of pseudo paid attention to this, and it's totally true where he's just, you can see him having these big shaggy suits that he's wearing until mm. things start to go well for him, but... Uh, I just want to quickly mention, I had to look it up, mm. I couldn't remember what film it was, but uh, if you like the idea of sort of like the discussion of luck is mm. sort of like this meta sort of physical thing you should check out the film intact mm. intacto is the full name okay. it's on netflix stream it's by juan carlos Fresnadillo, who did 28 weeks later okay. he did um was it he did um what's the other one uh, intruders he just did oh, okay. intruders this year which i saw down uh south by southwest i interviewed him even nice but intact uh is sort of a story about all these people who are cultivating this skill of luck or hmm. this this inner thing they they have this go and they they sort of have their like this ongoing competition where hmm. they're trying to kill each other off to yeah, sort of work. it's really it's really pretty interesting so I'll if you like the out. idea of luck check out you intact out slash too. intacto it's a it's a it, i dug it it's cool cool it, uh, you know who who was in it uh max von Cito, Ooh, Cito. Nice. Cito. he's in it as well so spanish film though interestingly enough hmm. uh yeah check that out cool the resurrection though yes of Alec Baldwin. Began. The penultimate 
penultimate? Is he dead? Oh, no, no, it's true. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, the resurrection occurred with... The resurrection kind of says he yeah. was dead, too. Come on. Well, his career was at that point. <laughs> yeah, oh, He's yeah. not physically dead. Okay. Uh, 30 Rock. Mm-hmm. The return to prominence of Alec Baldwin with the Tina Fey comedy series on NBC yes. about a variety show. Mm-hmm. Would you call it a variety show? Yeah. Sketch comedy. Sketch comedy show on NBC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, Alec Baldwin played Jack Donaghy. Essentially the, being Lorne Michaels. Even bigger than that, he's the director of the network. Oh, that's true. Yeah, so, but I mean, start, when it starts off, his personality and his character role yes. li- with Tina Fey's character is very yes. much like Lorne Michaels and Tina Fey was at SNL. Yes. I would say she's almost sort of like uh, Lorne Michaels, actually, hmm. for because she's running the show. You yeah. You think about it, sort of, though. Yeah. Anyway, she might be the Jenna in this scenario. Mm. I don't know. I'm trying to extrapolate. <laughs> like, anyway... Um, <laughs> Where do you come down on 30 Rock? You know, 30 Rock was one of those shows that right out of the gate just just it was hit. it just boom. Yeah, like more hit. than I felt a sitcom had hit in a long time. It was fresh, it was new, it was um self-referential to the network in a way that I don't feel had been done since the earlier Simpsons with Fox in like the 90s. I would say even more so. I mean, like the way that they skewer oh, NBC definitely. is especially like... as they've gone on, but I mean in the in the sense of like initially, like just mm. it had been a while since I felt like a show had come out and right off the bat been like the network we work for is dumb. Like that's quite okay, a, you sure. know, in as a statement. Sure. And so I felt it was very ballsy of them as just a concept and i didn't i expected because of that it wouldn't last so Mm -hmm. i'm very happy to see that not only has it lasted but that it's ending on its own terms it's not ending because it's being canceled it's not ending because ratings suck Uh, i I think probably alec baldwin has somewhat dictated that because he's wanted to get out of it for a while but he's also said it's his favorite job he's ever had is playing uh jack donaghy for 30 rock which is totally understandable it's such a great character here's the problem with 30 rock tracy morgan do you lo- think that's a problem? I do. Like hmm. in for in terms of Tracy Morgan's career, I think it's probably the best stuff he's done. Mm-hmm. But his character drives me nuts really? the longer the show goes on. Hmm. The longer the show goes on, the only characters I care about are Tina Fey and Alec Baldwin. Like the rest of the storylines are just like See, I don't and, care and I feel about that way this. pretty much only about Jenna. I feel like as I with the exception of the most recent season, I felt like Jenna, the more Jenna the show's got the worst. The but. more Ma- Jack McBrayer, it's kind of blah. Oh, come on. Come on. He's like, it's like the Tracy Morgan, Jenna, and Jack McBrayer sort of like comedy is like mm. literally just the same thing every episode. They don't feel like they grow at all. Like, I feel very little progress in terms of those characters. Okay. Whereas Tina Fey and Jack, mm-hmm. or uh, Alec Baldwin, Jack Donaghy really feel like they've gone on sort of like journeys through the course of the show. And it's sort of like, I, I mean, honestly, you could cut them the rest of the stuff out. And I would enjoy the show that much more. It'd be like 10 minutes long, probably. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I would, I, I like the show. I think Tina Fey, Alec Baldwin, tremendous. Tracy Morgan, um, What's her name? Um, Jane Chris. Jane Krakowski. Krakowski. Occasionally they pop up, same with Jack McBrayer, mm-hmm. and are funny. But most of the time, it's just sort of like I, I'm, I'm just like phoning in my hmm. attention span. Interesting. For them. Yeah. I think it's interesting also to note that since we brought up the fact that the only Oscar uh, Alec Baldwin's ever been nominated for was Cooler. Cooler. The fact that for Thirty Rock, as of 20, 2012... Alec Baldwin has won the SAG Awards, Screen Actors Guild Award, for Outstanding Actor in a Comedy Series every year since the show has started. Mm. A feat held by no other actor in either drama or comedy. I will say, I didn't see that, but if you look at like the Golden Globes, mm-hmm. I think he is the only person from the show to be nominated every year. Hmm. He's only won three of six i think hmm. one two three yeah he won he won 2007 he won 2009 and he won 2010 i'm not surprised he won 2009 because the show's 22 emmy nominations it got in 19 in 2009 were the most a comedy show has ever received in a single year which is funny because when i was looking up these facts i think it was like 2007 it was like the show's 2007 year where they got 17 nominations was the most and then it was like i scrolled down it was like 2009 where they got 22 nominations was that at that point the most yeah i should also know looking through all the stuff that um They've gotten nominated for Best Comedy Musical a handful of times. They've won it, it looks like, once or twice. Mm-hmm. But uh, besides Alec Baldwin, Tina Fey has been nominated every year as well. Hmm. And she has won, it looks like, just 
twice. She won 2000. Oh, she was not nominated in 2007. That is the mm. only time. He was the only one in 2007, but every other year she's been nominated. Wow. She's won twice. So, um,. I'm glad they really carry. They are the heart and soul. Of oh, definitely, show. and it's it's such an interesting. They have such an interesting dichotomy as far as characters to make a show, that to make a show that could so easily go towards one audience. Mm. I feel feel a little bit more balanced because mm. not only the the male female, the older younger, the you know mentor mentee, but their political viewings. She's. Sure. I love how, especially in the most recent season, the current season, they've really, and last season, highlighted very well that uh, Jack is a very conservative Republican, he's very aware of it, he's very control of it, and because of it, he succeeds. Liz is very much a fully embodied lib liberal Democrat who kind of knows what she's talking about, but loves it and will fight for it just as much. Like yeah. it's, I, I think they do an and interesting it's, job. It's, at... it's also funny when you think about how liberal Alec Baldwin really is. That yeah. he's playing like, <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's just I, I love, I love the balance. They do a good job at that show. Like specifically, their election episode this mm. year was probably, I feel like everyone should watch before they vote the first time, just because it did such a great job at showing, showing both sides and thinking about it as a grant, as like at the American consciousness, not left or right, sure. and what you should do, but just like hey. This is why, as Americans, you should vote. Like, I just, I, it's a great show, and I love, I love the self self-referential, breaking the fourth wall. The live episodes yeah. they've done with the show have been just fantastic. All right, that brings us to this Wednesday, the twenty yes, first yes. mm -hmm. of November. We are talking Rise of the Guardians. Mm -hmm. This is the story of um, when an evil spirit pitch launches an assault on. Earth, the immortal guardians team up to protect the innocent children of the world. Mm -hmm. Which the guardians are essentially what Santa Claus, yeah, all the different Jack holiday, Frost, uh, Easter Bunny, mm -hmm. Tooth Fairy, etc., etc. Yeah, all those different mythological um, holiday creatures and spirits. So you got like Chris Pine as Jack Frost, mm -hmm. like uh, Jude Law plays the bad guy, yep. right? Pitch. Yeah. Isla Fisher is the Tooth Fairy. Mm. Hugh Jackman is the Easter Bunny. Nice. I think uh, Alec Baldwin is essentially Santa Claus. Ah, uh, yes. North. Yes. Um, but, you know, I think the idea is cute enough. I don't know if this is really high priority viewing for me, especially when you've got Life of Pi coming out the same mm -hmm. day and Silver Lining Playbook coming out the same mm -hmm. day, which both of which are fantastic movies. Yeah, but you know, they, I, I got to give him credit because Thanksgiving weekend, just like Christmas weekend, is a huge family go to the theater event. And, y you know, Considering before it's even Halloween, we start putting Christmas decorations up. You put a story that has multiple holiday-themed people around one holiday preparing for the next big holiday, and it's a kids' animated movie with celebs. I feel it's like gonna make a lot of money. It's, yeah, it's gonna least. make tons of money, even if it's not good. I'm pretty sure. I I would say safe bet it's gonna beat Life of Pi. Oh, without a doubt. No as doubt far as box Which, office. Quality-wise, I haven't seen Rise of the Guardians, but Life of Pi is excellent, so... Oh, you've seen Life of Pi? Oh, yes. Oh. And it's good in 3D, too. What? Mm. what? You just said something good about 3D? I know. Who totally. is this guy? I know. Who is he? I know. <laughs> and, uh... Silver Lion Playbook is one of those films that seems like destined to get a Best Picture nomination every once in a while. Is that the Bradley Cooper? David O. Russell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this one has its... its, its you know, I mean, if, you're, if you've sure. got, uh, if you, all your in-laws are visiting or, not, you know, just actual direct family and you got tons of children Easy, yeah. and they're annoying the crap out of you, crap tell crazy. grandma to take them to Rise of the Guardians and sit back and drink a half a bottle of wine. Yeah. It's interesting, That's to see, doing. <laughs> interesting to see the director, Peter Ramsey, mm. hasn't done any other films. This is sort of his Ooh. breakout film, but he has done, uh, he was a story artist slash head of story on films like Monsters vs. Aliens and oh, okay. Shrek 3. So, so he's so definitely been behind the scenes working done on animated, animated stuff films. before so he should have a little bit of a skill yeah. going in so that's not bad we love alec baldwin's yeah. too bad 30 rocks gonna end it'll be interesting to see what he does afterwards yeah. if anything looking oh, i'm sure he's not dead dude once <laughs> I'm again i'm not saying he's dead greg is pronouncing alec baldwin <laughs> dead already i'm not saying he's i dead. look forward to what you're doing next alec oh. baldwin i'll say that <laughs> uh with that being said uh join us next week for our dvd rundown mm -hmm. for the week of november 27th mm -hmm. and you can always find us on mcguffinpodcast.com twitter.com slash mcguffincast yes. facebook.com slash mcguffinpodcast mm -hmm. Phone number, 323-761-9842. We're on Blip, 
We're on iTunes. We're on Miro. We're on Roku. You can check in and get glue. Leave us some reviews, comments, yeah. whatever. On iTunes or Bug something. us yeah. on all these various forums. Ask us questions. Tell us about the horrible Black Friday deals that you may or may not have survived. Yeah. And we'll see you next time. We will. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to bite the side style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.